when you were a child, what was your dream life? Like, what did you dream your life, your future would be like? Did you think maybe I'll be a teacher or a police officer or, or I, I'll, I'll be a lawyer or a doctor? What was the dream you had uh, for your future? I heard my kids the other day talking in the car about what cars they're going to drive, what their house is going to look like. And I think as children, we all kind of dream about the future. I know for me as a kid, I wanted to be a lawyer. I ended up being a convicted felon. Those two things didn't jive very well. Right in my teenage years, I wanted to be a rapper, but guess what? Roseburg's not the mecca for rap, okay? And uh, even though I had a pretty sweet name, Skittles, all right, that was my rapper name. I wrote some awesome raps, which were basically emo poetry. Um, uh, I didn't never took off for me, right? But I think we all kind of dream about our future. But I, in all of that dreaming, I bet none of us thought about the reality of suffering grief and loss being a part of our future. That when those things come into our life, it feels like this foreign object. It's embedded itself in your life, in my life. That our, but the reality is that our lives are kind of pockmarked by suffering. And today, we're going to continue our series in Philippians, where we're still in chapter one, picking up where Pastor Craig left off last week. And we're going to look at this idea of suffering and my, my title for the message today is Advancing the Kingdom because Paul talks about how his suffering does that. We're going to be in Philippians 1, verses 12 to 18. So if you want to hold that place in your Bible. But I want to pause for a moment. I realize there are those of us in the room who are walking through real suffering right now. The loss of a relationship, a divorce, the loss of a loved one, a death. Uh, disease coming into the picture, relational tensions, maybe uh, a relationship that you thought it was going to be this and it's not. All of us walk through suffering. Suffering is a normative experience in a broken world. But more than that, suffering is a normative experience for Christians. If you look at scripture, you see people of God and the saints suffering. Job is a picture of suffering. Moses had to deal with people whining in the wilderness for 40 years. Then he got to the edge of the promised land, didn't go in. The apostles all went through immense suffering. Jesus himself suffered to the point of death on a cross. And in a comfort addicted culture, when suffering comes our way, it can feel very much like a foreign reality. But this is a normative experience in a broken world, and specifically that God uses suffering to advance the kingdom. So I want to be careful because I realize some of us are really walking through this right now. And I don't want you to feel shamed today, but I do want to extend the reality of what we see in Scripture as there is hope in the midst of our suffering. So I'm going to read to us Philippians 1, 12 to 18. I just want everybody to close your eyes right now. I'm going to give you a little picture. Close your eyes. Paul, remember, he's writing this letter from a Roman prison cell. He would have been famished because though he was a Roman citizen, he didn't, they didn't ration much food for even Roman citizens. He would have been in, in stocks, most likely, that would lock his joints into place. He's in physical pain. And he's there in the Roman prison cell, and he writes this passage. Philippians 1, 12 to 18. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. You can go ahead and and open your eyes. I wanted us to have this picture, right? Paul is imprisoned for the gospel and he's writing to his friends. Now, put yourself in Paul's shoes. 
You're in a Roman prison. You're being tortured. You're being held captive because of your faith. What kind of letter are you going to write to your church friends? I, I don't know about you, but to me, it's going to be, get me out of here, dude. Bring some dynamite. We're going to blow up the walls. It's going to be a prison break. I need some food. Bring me some nourishment. Like, let's get out of this situation. It's not what Paul writes to them. Paul sees the unstoppable gospel moving forward. Let's look at it again. He says, verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's talking about his imprisonment. He's talking about his sufferings for Christ. That what has happened to me has has really uh, served the gospel. And he says, He's kind of anticipating that the Philippians are going to have some concerns because the last time they saw Paul imprisoned, God did something amazing, right? Acts 16, Pastor Craig talked about this last week. They, they were, he was imprisoned and Paul is this unconquerable man, right? You tell him, hey, we're going to kill you. He's like, to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's good with me, man, either way. Let's go, right? I'll die for Christ. I'll live for Christ. Um, my sufferings are, are worthy of Christ. I, I, and he was this man, this, this unconquerable spirit, not because of his own spiritual prowess, but because of the spirit of God who lived in him and produced the fruit of the spirit of joy, even in a hopeless place. And so here he says, look, this has served to advance the gospel. Last time you saw me in prison, God did this earthquake thing and my shackles came loose and the doors busted open. And he did something different. Now, this time I'm imprisoned again. And understandably so, the Philippians may be asking like, well, is God not with you now? Because last time he did that, now you're stuck here. And so he's encouraging them and saying, look, God is still using me. God's still moving forward. This is an unstoppable gospel that we're a part of here. And then he goes on to tell you what the fruit of the gospel is. He says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. And to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. The whole imperial guard is aware of Paul's sufferings for Christ. This is a huge testimony to these people who are pagan idolaters, Romans, worshiping false gods. And here they're watching Paul suffer. And I looked up some estimates on what what is the numbers of an imperial guard. On the low end, it's about 4,000 men. On the high end, it's between 10 and 12,000. And so Paul's sufferings are a huge testament to the power of God. They're watching him as he's imprisoned and no doubt singing songs to God and, and worshiping God and sharing the gospel. And he says it's bearing fruit because the whole imperial guard has heard about this. But it goes beyond Paul. Because there are others who are watching this imprisonment take place. And here's what's happening in them. Verse 14. Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They're looking at Paul's response to hardship and suffering with joy and praise. And like, that's what this is about. And so they go out and they're they're preaching the gospel with boldness and without fear. They're looking at... Paul's sufferings and saying, God is still using this. We have nothing to fear. The gospel does not stop. You can't chain it. You can't imprison it. There's no fetter you can place on it to hold it down. It moves forward. The gospel is unstoppable, even in hopeless circumstances. Paul's going through immense suffering. And he has an eternal perspective of his earthly suffering. He has an eternal perspective of his earthly suffering. And it allows him to have joy. Joy is not constrained by circumstance. It's found in the hope of Jesus. So what is your response to suffering? When you're walking through the dark night of the soul, what is your response? In the early 1800s, there's a guy named Adoniram Judson. I know that's a really weird name, but that's his name. Adoniram Judson. This is a a depiction of him. And uh, he was one of the first, he was actually, in fact, the first missionary to Myanmar. 
he had a heart for the for the uh, people of Myanmar, and and he went there, and he had an amazing resume, like. He went there, first missionary there. First thing he does is create a, a Burmese to English dictionary so that other missionaries and other ministers that come there can learn the language and share the gospel in their own native tongue, the native people. And then he oversees the, the translation work of the Bible into the Burmese language. And, and he, uh, the, he gives this, this Bible to them in their own native tongue, in their own heart's language. More than that, in 1819, he, he established a church there where converts are coming to faith left and right. And people are being baptized. And, and in his years of ministry there, something like 500,000 people could trace their spiritual lineage back to the work that he began. On top of that, he was about building up leaders and, and pastors in the church and setting them out into the mission field. He, he created a school where kids could learn how to read the Bible. This man laid the foundation for missionaries that are still going there today, building on the work that God wrought through him. In fact, we have some missionaries that are hoping to go into Myanmar, Eric and Amber Wright, to continue to build on what this man started. And you may, you may hear his resume and you're like, I want that kind of kingdom impact. That's amazing. While we like the result I'm betting you don't want his story. You see, when he first went to Myanmar, he and his wife and their three children, um, they lived there for a while, but they didn't have the immunities to the diseases in the area. And all three of his children fell ill and died. In 1819, when he founds the church and people are coming to faith left and right, the, the government doesn't like that. And so they begin to, uh, they imprison him under the false pretense that he's a, a spy for England during the, the English-Burmese War. And he's in prison for 19 months, tortured, as though he was a spy who had information. And so uh, he, he said during this time, the only thing that kept him alive was his wife's devotion to him. She would bribe the guards and sneak him in some food as he was starving. He, she would bring him some comfort items and she even smuggled in a, a Bible. The only thing that kept him alive was his wife during this time. Eventually, he was released, not because he was found innocent, but because the Burmese government needed him to help translate the peace talks between them and England. And so he's released, and a short while later, his wife dies. Six months after his wife dies, his two-year-old daughter dies. And then Adoniram goes through the darkest period of his life for six months he goes out into the middle of a tiger-infested jungle that is known for having man-eating tigers, builds a hut, and lives there off a very small ration of rice. This is a man who feels utterly hopeless. He's wrestling. He's suffered much. He's lost four children. He's been imprisoned and tortured, and he's lost his bride. And in the midst of all of that pain and suffering, he could not see what God was doing all around him, in him, and through him. And I believe in that hut in the jungle, he was wrestling. Is this worth it? Can God do anything with the pain I've walked through? And after six months of wrestling, he comes out and decides, yes, I see that God has, has worked through my suffering. I see that God has worked through my pain. I don't understand all of why, but I see the fruit. And he continues the rest of his term of 40 years of ministry in Myanmar. Now, we, we, we may think the results are awesome, but I don't think any of us wants to walk through his story. And as I was talking um, to, to one of the women on our staff, Shauna Murphy, she oversees care ministry as well as women's ministry. And I was just like, Shauna, I, I want to lean into this idea of suffering well because I know people are really in the thick of it. And, and she had some great wisdom. Uh, she said, oftentimes when people are in the midst of suffering, they say, why God? Why are you doing this to me? And she said, if you can change the question from why God to who is God? My life hurts. Is God still the comforter? 
This is bad. Is God still love? Is God still good? This, this, my life feels out of control. Is God still in control? In, st- in the midst of suffering, if we can change our question from why God, why, to who are you? Are you still good despite this hurt, despite this pain, despite this trial? And if we can change the question, she said, our comfort is found in the character of God. I love that statement. Your comfort in the midst of suffering is found in the character of God, who he is. And we have to come back to those truths to bring us through. So as you're in the midst of suffering, some of you are walking through it right now. If you're not walking through it right now, it'll come. It's a broken world. When we walk through suffering, God's character can be our comfort. The next thing I want to pull out of this passage is that Paul sees that there is an ever-present mission field. Ever-present mission field. Let's look at it again in the passage. Verse 13 says, It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He he doesn't say, man, I'm stuck in the prison and I really need to get out of here and get some ministry work going. There's churches need to be planted. Leaders need to be built up. I need to go rebuke the Corinthians. I need to get to Ephesus. I need to go to Philippi. He doesn't say, hey, the mission is out here. He says, who's right of, around me? Who's my sphere of influence? That's my mission field. And during this season, we see Paul imprisoned. Where's his mission field? His captors. And and he's sharing the gospel. And the whole imperial guard begins to see Christ in him. Your sphere of influence is your mission field. Where you live, work, and play. I want you to take a moment on your notes. And I want you to write down five people that you have influence over. I'm going to give you a couple seconds here. I want you to write down five people you have influence over. These are the people God has called you to be on mission in their lives. Now, I want to ask a question. How many of those people are in your family? You see, it's easy for me, at least, to think that my mission is elsewhere outside of my home. And this question was asked to me early in ministry. Is your home your first ministry? And I wrestled with that. And at times, yes, and at times, no. But we, as leaders of the home, men and women, the the husband and wife, we're, we're there to form the picture of God for our family. Your greatest ministry is not in this building. It's at your house. It's with your husband. It's with your wife. It's with your children. Paul saw the people around him as his mission field. The people God has placed around you, primarily your family, is your mission field. Is your home your first ministry? Or are they suffering at the expense of some other ministry? These are my my three kiddos, Asher on the left here, uh, Ember in the middle, and then Audra on the right. And let's be honest, like, this is hard to do. It's not easy to raise kids in the gospel. It's not easy to to make this the banner of your home, right? Like, I've struggled with this. I remember when I first uh, came to family church, and I I had a, a, a daughter who was a little bit past the toddler age, right? And, and I was trying to teach her about God. And one day, uh, my mentor asked me, like, how are you doing that? What, what resources are you utilizing? And I said, well, there's this book I've been reading. It's super helpful. And, and it's, I'm just, I'm being challenged and I'm seeing God transform my thinking on it, uh, about him through it. And so he's like, okay, what book is that? And I said, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. It's a college textbook. And I'd have my little girl sitting on my lap reading something that doesn't meet her where she's at. I had no idea what I was doing, right? And he's like, hey, man, how about like a kid's Bible? And I was like, oh, my goodness, mind equals blown, right? Like, this is not meeting her where she's at at four, five, six years old. 
and it blew my mind. And so I wanted to give just some practical resources for families, right? This is a topic that's often, it's hard to ask for help in because there's so much shame and comparison around parenting. But let's just be real. None of us have got this locked in. It's easy to look at another Christian family and say, they've got it all together. I need to measure up to them. We're all trying to figure this out. And so I just want to give some practical resources. Um, one that has been really big and helpful for my family is, is called Theology. Now, this is a theology book for kids. And it tells a story about uh, two kids who find uh, this old tome in the basement of a church and they learn and discover amazing things about God. It's like a systematic theology for kids. A great resource. You can find it on Amazon. Um, another one, this one's kind of falling apart because we used it so much, uh, is the Jesus Storybook Bible. If you have young kids, this is a great resource. It goes through some of the major stories in the Bible, points all of them to Jesus. It's an awesome resource, and we used this a ton when my kids were younger. As you get kids that are in the older elementary age, there's uh, this devotional by Louis Giglio, Indescribable. It talks about God and science, and it may challenge some of what they learn in, in school. And so this is, these are great, helpful resources for the younger kids. But if you have older kids, Right Now Media is a free resource through our church. And there are thousands of videos on there that you can use to, to help shape the picture of God in your home. But Paul saw that those around him were the mission field. Not just some, somewhere else. God has placed you where he has you for a reason, for a purpose. Where you work, you're called to be a light there. Where you, where you play, the teams you're on, you're called to be a light there. In your home, you're called to be a light there. And I've been so encouraged that this is actually happening at Family Church. I, I was talking with a guy named Preston um, from the South Umpqua campus a couple days ago, and he was telling me how he's been praying for this guy at his workplace and sharing scripture with him. And he said, I'm so excited, man. He shot me a text and he said, hey, can we sit down and talk about God? <laughs> what? And I, I said, Preston, you're living out the blessed rhythms. Like you're, you're praying for him. You're listening to his life story. You've invited him into your life by eating with him, serving him and sharing. This is what discipleship is. And it's happening at family church. It's awesome. We have an ever present mission field. Wherever you go, whoever you have influence over, that's who God's called you to. The last thing I want us to look at is that Paul sees there's a common mission. Let's look at it here in the text. He says, Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he's saying, look, as, as I have been imprisoned, there's kind of a, a vacuum in the local church leadership, right? Other people have stepped up into that vacuum. And they're speaking with boldness. But there is a problem, he points out. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. So there are those who are preaching Christ like, I want to be the next Apostle Paul. There's some pride, there's some envy, there's some divisional thinking that's in there. Their motives are wrong. But he says, the latter, do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. I love that Paul had this perspective on his suffering. I'm here for the defense of the gospel. He had that eternal perspective. And he goes on, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So he says, look, there's these two types. These leaders who have come into this vac came into this vacuum, uh, while I'm in prison, some are preaching Christ because they love God and they love others and it's from goodwill and they want the gospel to move forward. Others, on the other hand, are rivals and envious and prideful. And what does Paul say about this whole picture of what's happened in his absence? Look at this. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. He looks at these other leaders who are preaching the gospel, and he doesn't say they're taking my people. He doesn't say uh, it's me versus them, even the ones who have the wrong motives. He looks at Christ is preached, and in that I take great joy. 
And I just want to wade into this for just a moment. How do you view other church leaders? How do you view other churches? You see, what's very easy to do is to, to say, well, in, in the life of a church, some people come and some people go. And when people go and they leave and go to another church, it's very easy to label that church the enemy. I know this firsthand. When I first came into church leadership uh, many moons ago, um, I, I was poured into and loved and, and befriended by a guy who basically became my best friend. And a few years later, he uh, felt called by God to leave the church and go to a different church. And I labeled that church my enemy. They stole my friend. For years, I struggled with looking at that church with love. You know what? The gospel was moving forward there. The mission was moving forward there. People are being saved, baptized. Disciples are being built up. Leaders are being sent out. But I labeled them an enemy because I, I thought they took something from me. And I want to be able to say with Paul, Look, I may not agree with all of their philosophy. I may, I may not even agree with all of their secondary, non-essential theology. But is Christ proclaimed? And if so, I want to say with Paul, in that I rejoice. You see, we need a bigger picture than, than just family church. We link arms with what God is doing throughout Douglas County. That there are those other churches in our area who are proclaiming the gospel. You may look at their methods or their philosophy or their theology in some non-essential areas and think, ah, I'm not sure about that. But as Christ proclaimed, and I want to say like Paul, I look at these other leaders who are proclaiming Jesus and say, yes, let's go. Because Douglas County is a broken area and we need other ministers of the gospel that we link arms with and walk together in the mission. So we have this unstoppable gospel. We have this, uh, uh, the ever-present mission field and a common mission with those around locally and globally that it's moving this thing forward. Don't you want to be a part of that? It begins with those same blessed rhythms we've been talking about for a long time. Begin in prayer. Listen to people. Eat with them. Uh, invite them into your life. Serve them and share. And as we do that, we will see God move forward despite the circumstances in our life. Whether we're suffering or rejoicing, he can move forward. We will see those in our sphere of influence come to faith and, and challenged and, and baptized. And, and we will be able to see this common mission move forward in our county. I'm going to release to the campuses. Jesus loves you guys and so do I. All right, I want to thank you guys so much for sticking around and joining us uh, in the online uh, community. Thank you so much for being here with us today as we kind of dug further into Philippians 1. And I really want to leave us with just a couple of challenges. Firstly, where is God moving forward, or where's the gospel moving forward, rather, in your sphere of influence? Looking at the people around you, who's teachable? Who, who's hungry? Who's asking questions? And if not, if you don't see that, then, then begin praying, God, show me. Where's the gospel moving forward? Who's hungry? Who has trajectory? And the second thing we want to challenge you to is that who is partnering with you, right? If we have this, this common mission, we have people all over family church. We're all called to the same mission. People, helping people find and follow Jesus. If we're called to the same mission, how can we link arms and encourage one another? We need a community. Remember, in the last series we went through, we, we came to the conclusion we want to be a community on purpose with a purpose. Well, we have to create that community intentionally. God has given us the purpose to live out. We need to create the community intentionally. So who is linking arms with you, can pray with you, can, can challenge you, can encourage you to continue to live out the mission of God where God has placed you? Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for the mission that you, the Son, the Spirit were on in pursuing wretch like me and, and, and coming after us with, with your love and extending grace. And God, as we, as we endeavor to, to share Christ with our, our, our sphere of influence, let it not be, God, from an obligation or some sort of legalistic effort, 
But because I have experienced the gospel, I've got to now extend it. I pray that that would be our heart, God, that as we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that we would then go to those you have placed in our lives and share that truth. God, I pray this week, as we go out to where we live, work, and play, that the gospel would move forward and that we would be encouraged and see that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining. Love you. Have a great Sunday.